The Little Blue Book, Connie Mendez. Warning. Any metaphysical book should be read many times. Each time it is re-read, it is better understood. Now, only what is practiced remains with us, for what is only read, and not used, goes away. Introduction. The present little book is written in what this author calls words of a penny. That is to say, in the simplest terms, with the intention of making it understandable to all those who need to know the truth of God and do not have the knowledge, with which to digest the texts of psychology and metaphysics as they are written in Spanish. Every time we hear or read something new, unknown to us, it awakens cells that were dormant in our brain. The second time we stumble upon that new idea, we understand it a little better. The cells begin to work on the idea, and soon after, light is made in our mind, that is, we accept the idea, adopt it, and put it into practice automatically. This is how we awaken, learn, evolve, and advance. It is not necessary to make superhuman efforts to get things into our heads. It is a natural process. However, we must be willing to reread, reread, and reread again until we feel that what we have learned is automatic. That is all. Carry a copy of this booklet with you in your purse or pocket. Put another one on your bedside table. Reread it often, especially every time you have a problem, every time you are faced with a distressing or upsetting situation, whatever it may be. Something amazing will happen to you, and that is that the booklet will open on the page you need to consult, and you will think, it seems that this has been written for me. Jesus Christ said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. Metaphysics is one of these mansions, that is, the study of mental spiritual laws. It does not interfere with spiritualism, although this is also a mansion in the Father's house. May this little work bring you all the peace and prosperity that it has brought to so many others. Blessings to you. Chapter 1. Dynamic Christianity. Before undertaking any trade, the candidate who is going to perform it receives instructions or study the technique of it. However, there are those who undertake their task totally blind, without instructions, without technique, without compass, compass or design, without notions of what they will find. It is the human being who sets out on the task of living, without even knowing what life is, without knowing why some lives pass in opulence and satisfaction, while others pass in misery and suffering. Some begin with all the advantages that affection can devise, and yet they are pursued by a shortcut of calamities, and the human being struggles in conjectures, all erroneous, and the day of his death comes, without his having even guessed the truth of it all. Learn the great truth, what you think is manifested. Thoughts are things. It is your attitude that determines everything that happens to you. Your own concept is what you see, not only in your body and character, but outwardly, in your living conditions, in the material, yes, just as you hear it. Thoughts are things, now you see. If you are in the habit of thinking that you are of a healthy constitution, whatever you do, you will always be healthy. But you change your way of thinking. You let yourself be instilled with the fear of disease, and you start to get sick. You lose your health. If you are born into wealth, you may always be wealthy, unless someone convinces you that there is such a thing as destiny, and you start believing that yours can change, according to bumps and setbacks. Because you are believing it, your life, what happens to you, obeys your beliefs and what you express in words. It is a law, a principle. Do you know what a principle is? It is an invariable law that never fails. This law is called the principle of mentalism. If in your mind is rooted the idea that accidents lie in wait for us at every step, if you believe that the infirmities of old age are inevitable, if you are convinced of your bad or good luck, whatever you normally expect for better or for worse, that is the condition which you will see manifest in your life and in everything you do. That is the reason for what happens to you. You are never aware of the ideas that fill your mind. They are formed according to what we are taught or what we hear people say. As almost all, we ignore the laws that govern life, laws called of creation. Almost all of us spend our lives fabricating contrary conditions for ourselves, 
seeing how that which promised to be so good turns bad, groping as if blindly, without compass, rudder, or compass, blaming our ills on life itself and learning by dint of blows and blows or attributing them to the will of God, God's will. With what you have read so far, you will have realized that the human being is not what we have been led to believe. That is to say, a cork in the middle of the storm, tossed here and there according to the waves. His life, his world, his circumstances, everything he is and everything that happens to him are his creations and no one else's. He is the king of his empire. He is the king of his empire. He is the king of his empire. And if his opinion is precisely that he is but a cork in the middle of a storm, so be it. He has believed it and allowed it. To be born with free will means to have been created with the individual right to choose. Choose what? To think negatively or positively, to be pessimistic or optimistic, to think the ugly and the bad, what produces the ugly and the bad, or to think the good and the beautiful, and what produces the good and the beautiful outwardly or inwardly. Metaphysics has always taught that what we think often passes into the subconscious and settles there, acting as a reflection. Modern psychology has finally discovered it. When the human being is involved in the effects of his ignorance, that is to say that he himself has caused a calamity, he turns to God and begs him to deliver him from suffering. The man sees that God sometimes attends to him and that at other times, inexplicably, he does not attend to him. It is in the latter case when his relatives console him by telling him that we must resign ourselves to God's will. In other words, everyone takes it for granted that the will of the Creator is evil. But at the same time, religion teaches that God is our Father, a Father all loving kindness, mercy. Do you see how these two theories do not agree? Does it seem like common sense to you that an all loving, infinitely wise Father could feel and express ill will towards his children? We, mortal fathers and mothers, could never attribute to any child the crimes we attribute to God. We would not be able to condemn to eternal fire a creature of our blood for a natural fault of his mortal condition. And do we consider that God is capable, that is to say, without our being clearly aware of it, we are attributing to God a nature of capricious and vindictive tycoon, full of ill will, dependent on our slightest infraction, to inflict on us punishments, out of all proportion. It is natural to think so when we are born. We live, ignoring, the rules and basic laws of life. We have already said the reason for our calamities. We produce them with our thoughts. In this is that we are made. In the image and likeness of the Creator. We are creators. Creators, each of us, of our own manifestation. Now then, why does it seem that God attends sometimes and not others? You will see. Prayer is the purest and highest thought that can be thought. It is to polarize the mind to the highest positive degree. These are vibrations of light, which we throw out when we pray, that is, when we think of God. These vibrations should instantly transform into perfect and beautiful all the surrounding dark conditions as when a lamp is brought into a room which is in darkness. Provided that the one who is praying thinks and believes that the God to whom he is asking is a loving Father who wishes to give all good to his child. In that case, God always attends. But how in general, mankind has the habit of asking like this, O oh, Papa God, get me out of this predicament. I know you will think that it is not good for me because you want to impose this test on me. In other words, he has already denied any possibility of receiving it. He has more faith in that God who taught us, capricious, vindictive, full of ill will, who only waits for us to commit the first offense to inflict on us punishments of satanic cruelty. For he who thus asks only receives according to his own image of God. It is as simple as I tell you. Now never again forget that God's will for you is good, health, peace, happiness, well-being, all the good that he has created. Never again forget that God is neither the judge, nor the policeman, nor the executioner, nor the tyrant that you have been led to believe. The truth is that he has created seven laws, seven principles that act in everything and always, and do not rest for a single minute. 
They are responsible for maintaining order and harmony throughout creation. No policemen are needed in the spirit. He who does not march with the law punishes himself. What you think is manifested, so learn to think correctly, and with the law, so that all the good that God wants for you is manifested. St. Paul said that God is closer to us than our feet and our hands, and even closer than our breath. That's why we don't have to cry out to him to be heard. It is enough to think a little of him so that what seems disordered begins to recompose itself. He has created us, and he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows why we act this way or that way, and he does not expect us to behave like saints when we are just learning to walk in this spiritual life. I am going to beg you, do not believe anything I am telling you, without first checking it out. It is your divine and sovereign right. Do not do what you have done up to now. Accept everything you hear and everything you see, without giving yourself the opportunity to judge between what is right and what is wrong. Chapter 2 the mechanics of thought. All day and all night long we are thinking an infinite number of different things. A kind of constant cinematographic movie, although unconnected, is always going through our mind. Among so many different ideas, we stop to contemplate, examine or study some more than others. Why? Because they have stimulated our feelings. They have produced in us a feeling of fear or antipathy, of sympathy or pity, a feeling of liking or disliking. It doesn't matter. The fact is that because of that feeling the idea interests us, we review it later, and perhaps we discuss it with someone. This is meditating, and what we meditate on goes to the subconscious, and is recorded there. Once an idea is recorded in the subconscious, it becomes a reflex. You know when the doctor taps you with some object, in a place around the knee, your leg jumps. You have been touched in a sensitive spot, and you have reacted, haven't you? In the same way, every time something happens in your life that refers to one of the ideas that are recorded in your subconscious, the reflex reacts in the exact way it was recorded. You adopt an attitude in accordance with the original feeling you felt when you first thought of that idea. Metaphysicians call this a concept, that is, a belief, a conviction. The subconscious is not discerning. It does not decide anything. It does not opine or think for itself. It has no power of protest, it has no will of its own. These are not its functions. Its only function is to react by putting in order the reflex it has been given. It is, in this sense, a wonderful filing cabinet, secretary automatic librarian, which neither rests nor fails ever. It also has no sense of humor. He does not know when an order has been given in jest or in earnest. So if your nose is a little bulging and if you, to make others laugh, you adopt the joke of calling it my stuffed potato nose. For example, as the subconscious is an exact servant, it has no sense of humor and only knows how to obey unconditionally. Then it will try by all means to fulfill the order given to it by your words and your feeling, and you will see how your nose looks more and more like a stuffed potato. The word metaphysics means beyond the physical. That is the science that studies and deals with everything that is invisible to the physical senses, it gives you the reason for all that we do not understand, for all that is mysterious, and it is accurate, as you will see as you read this booklet. Now you see, you remember the first time you heard the word cold mentioned. You were very small. Your elders said the word and taught you to fear it. By dint of repeating it, they taught you to understand it. They told you not to get your feet wet, not to stand in a draft, not to go near someone because he had a cold and it would stick, etc., all this was recorded in the subconscious and became a reflex. You never had to remember the warnings of your elders. The damage was already done. From then on, your subconscious would give you a cold, the best it could give you, every time you stood in a draft, every time your feet got wet, every time you came near a cold, and every time you heard that there was a flu or cold epidemic, because of your elders, because of what you heard others say, because of what you have read in newspapers and advertisements, on radio and television, and above all because you ignore the metaphysical truth of life, you have accepted these erroneous ideas. These have become reflexes, which act without your premeditation, automatically, and which are the cause of all the ills which afflict you in the picture of your life. You have a bulky load of strange ideas, which affect all departments of your life, your body, your soul, and your mind.
Keep in mind that if you had not accepted them, if by your right to free will to choose, accept and reject, you had not accepted the negative, there is no germ, virus or power in the world which could have attacked or convinced your subconscious to act otherwise, other than the one you gave him. Your will, negative or positive, is the magnet that attracts to you the germs, the adverse circumstances or the good ones. As we have already said, your attitude, negative or positive in the face of events, determines for you the effects. Chapter 3. The Infallible Formula It turns out that every human mind contains an accumulation of opinions, convictions or misconceptions, contrary to truth and in conflict with the basic principles of creation which manifest themselves perennially in external conditions. All those calamities and sufferings which afflict man and the world in general, diseases, accidents, ailments, quarrels, disharmonies, deficiencies, failures, and even death. Happily, none of this conforms to the truth of being. Fortunately, there is a way to erase all these false beliefs and replace them with correct ones, which will not only produce positive, good, happy, right conditions and circumstances, but once the error is corrected and the truth is established in the subconscious, the negative things can never happen again in our lives. The order has been changed. The magnet has changed its pole. It is absolutely impossible to attract anything that does not already find its correspondence in us. The infallible formula is the following. Every time something undesirable happens to you, that you get sick, that an accident happens to you, that you are robbed, that you are offended, that you are molested. If you are the cause of some evil to another or to yourself, if you are afflicted with a physical or moral or character defect, if you dislike someone, if you detest them, or if you love too much and suffer for it, if you are tortured by jealousy, if you fall in love with someone who belongs to another, if you are the victim of injustice or the victim of domination by another, the list is endless. So tell yourself what condition is affecting you. Know the truth. Thus Jesus Christ, the greatest of all masters of metaphysics, said, Know the truth, and it shall set you free. Truth, the supreme law, is perfect harmony, beauty, goodness, justice, freedom, health, intelligence, wisdom, love, and bliss. Anything contrary to this is appearance. It is contrary to the supreme law of perfect harmony, and therefore it is a lie, because it is contrary to truth. Your higher self is perfect. At this moment and always has been perfect. It cannot get sick because it is life. It cannot die for the same reason. It cannot grow old. It cannot suffer. It cannot fear. It is beautiful. It is love, intelligence, wisdom, bliss. That is truth. It is your truth, mine, that of all human beings, and right now. It is not that the human being is God. Just like a drop of seawater, it is not the sea but it encompasses all that forms and contains the sea to an infinitesimal degree. And for an atom, that drop of water is a sea. Whatever you are manifesting, whatever is happening to you, that is contrary to perfect harmony, or whatever you yourself are doing or suffering contrary to perfect harmony, is due to an erroneous belief that you have created, that you know, and that you are reflexively throwing outward and attracting its equal from the outside. It has nothing to do with your higher self, it is still perfect. Your conditions and your situation are perfect. Now, in each of the circumstances listed above, you must remember what I have just told you. First of all, and then say mentally or aloud as you wish, I do not accept it. Say it firmly but with infinite gentleness. Mental works do not need physical strength. Neither thought nor spirit has muscles. When you say, I do not accept it, do it as if you were saying, I do not feel like it, calmly, but with the same conviction and firmness, without shouting, without violence, without a movement, without abruptness. After you have said, I do not accept it, remember that your higher self is perfect, that its conditions are perfect. Now say, I declare that the truth of this problem is harmony, love, intelligence, justice, abundance, life, health, etc., whatever is the opposite of the truth whatever is the opposite of the negative condition which is manifesting at that moment. Thank you, Father, for you have heard me. You don't have to blindly believe what you read. You have to check it out for yourself. In metaphysical language, this is called a treatment. After any treatment, you have to maintain the attitude you have stated. 
You cannot allow doubt to enter about the efficacy of the treatment, nor can you re-express in words the concepts, opinions and beliefs of before, because that destroys, nullifies the treatment. The purpose is to transform the mental pattern which has been dominating in the subconscious, that is, the mental climate in which you have been living, with all your negative set of circumstances. St. Paul said, you are formed by the renewal of your mind. This renewal is done by changing every old belief as it comes before our life or our conscience in conscious disagreement with the truth. There are convictions that are so deeply rooted that they are what in metaphysical language are called crystallizations. These require more work than others, but every denial and affirmation made with respect to these crystallizations erases the original design until it disappears completely and nothing remains but truth. You will see miracles occurring in your life, in your environment and in your conditions. You have no defects but the appearance of defects. What you see as moral or physical defects are transitory because as you know the truth of your true self, your Christ, your higher self, is a perfect child of God made in the likeness of the Father. The imperfections that you are presenting to the world begin to erase. It is a verifiable fact. Any student of Christian metaphysics can corroborate what I have just told you. This is the great truth. Never forget it and start practicing it now. The more you practice it, the more you will realize it. The more you will advance and the happier you will feel. Remember, you are unique like your fingerprints. You were created by a unique design for a special purpose that no one else but you can fulfill. It has taken you 14,000 years to evolve to where you are today. God's expressions are infinite. You and I are only two of those infinite expressions. Your Christ is an intelligent being who loves you deliriously and who has been waiting for centuries for you to recognize him. The time has come. Speak to him, ask him, and wait for his answers. He is the only guide and master for you. When you come to understand, accept, and realize this truth, it will be the birth of Christ for you. This is what is prophesied for this age. He is the Messiah. It is not that Jesus is born again now. It is that everyone will find the Christ in their conscience and in their heart. Just as it happened to Jesus, that is why he was called Jesus Christ. Chapter 4. The Decree. Every word uttered is a decree that manifests itself outwardly. The word is the spoken thought. Jesus said two things, which have not been taken seriously. One, by your words you will be condemned, and by your words you will be justified. This does not mean that others will judge us by what we say, although it is also true, as you may have seen, that the Master taught metaphysics, only that the race was not yet mature enough to understand it. On several occasions he warned that he still had many other things to say, but they could not be understood. On other occasions he said that he who had ears to hear, let him hear. The second reference he made to the power of the word was, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of his mouth, for what comes out of the mouth comes out of the heart. It cannot be expressed more clearly. I propose that you pay attention to all that you decree in a single day. Let us remind you, business is very bad. Things are very bad. Youth is lost. Traffic is impossible. Service is unbearable. You can't get service. Don't leave that roller because they steal it. Thieves steal on every corner. I'm afraid to go out. Careful, you're going to fall. Watch out, you're going to get killed. You'll get stepped on by a car. You're going to break that. How unlucky I am. I can't eat that, it hurts me. My bad memory. My allergy. My headache. My rheumatism. My bad digestion. That's a bandit. That one is a wretch. He had to be, when he wasn't. Do not be surprised or complain if by expressing it you see it happening. You have decreed it. You have given an order that must be carried out. Now remember and never forget, every word you utter is a decree. Positive or negative, if it is positive, it manifests into good. If it is negative, it manifests in evil. If it is against your neighbor, it is the same as if I decreed it against you that is returned to you. If it is kind and understanding towards others, you will receive kindness and understanding from others towards you. And when something annoying, negative, unpleasant happens to you, do not say, 
but I did not think or fear that this would happen to me. You must have the sincerity and humility to try to remember in what terms you expressed yourself about another person. At what moment came out of your heart a very old concept, rooted there, that perhaps is nothing more than a social custom, as the generality of those mentioned above, and that you really do not want to continue to use. As the feeling that accompanies a thought is what engraves it more firmly in the subconscious, the Master Jesus, who never used superfluous words, expressed it very well when he said, what comes out of the mouth comes out of the heart, and this gives us the unequivocal key. The first feeling that teaches us is fear. It is taught to us first by our parents and then by our religious teachers. When we feel fear, our heart races. We often say, my heart almost jumped out of my mouth, to show the degree of fear we feel at a given moment. Fear is what is behind all the negative phrases I quoted above. St. Paul said, we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Every time you find yourself saying a negative phrase, you will know what kind of misconception you have rooted in the subconscious, and you will know what kind of feeling it obeys. The fear or dislike cross it out, erase it by denying it as a liar, and affirm the truth, if you do not want to continue manifesting it on the outside. After a short time of this practice, you will notice that the way you speak is different, your way of thinking is different. You and your whole life will be transformed by the renewal of your mind. When you are in meetings with other people, you will be perfectly aware of the kind of concepts they have, and you will notice them in everything that happens to them. Whenever you hear negative conversations, do not affirm anything they express. Think, I do not accept it neither for me nor for them. You don't have to tell them. It is better not to divulge the truth that you are learning, not because you have to hide it, but because there is an occult maxim that says when the disciple is ready, the master appears. By the law of attraction, Everyone who is ready to move up a grade automatically approaches the one who can advance him, so do not try to be a catechist. Do not force anyone to receive lessons in the truth, for you may find that those whom you thought most willing are the least sympathetic with it. This is what Jesus meant when he said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you in pieces. Chapter 5. Does faith move mountains? Why and how? Everyone knows the saying and repeats it often. They repeat it like parrots, because they do not really know what it means, or why, or how it is that faith moves mountains. Few know that fear also moves mountains. Fear and faith are one and the same force. Fear is negative and faith is positive. Fear is faith in evil. That is, the conviction that bad things will happen. Faith is the conviction that what will happen is good, or that it will end well. Fear and faith are two sides of the same coin. Take a good look. You never fear that something good will happen to you, nor do you ever say, you have faith that bad things will happen to you. Faith is always associated with something we desire, and I don't think you desire evil for yourself. You fear it, don't you? Whatever you fear, you attract it, and it happens to you. Now, when it happens to you, you usually say with a triumphant air, Aha, I knew it, I felt it. And you run to tell and repeat it, as if you wanted to show off your powers of clairvoyance. And what actually happened is that you thought it in fear. Did you feel it? Of course you did. You felt it. You are saying it yourself. You know that whatever you think, feeling at the same time an emotion, is what manifests or attracts. You anticipated it and hoped for it. Anticipating and expecting is faith. Now notice that everything you expect with faith comes to you and happens to you. So, if you know that this is so, what prevents you from using faith for everything you desire? Love, money, health, etc. It is a natural law. It is a divine ordinance. Christ taught it in the following words, which you already know. Whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. I did not invent it. It is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. And St. Mark expresses it even more clearly. Whatever you ask for in prayer, you must believe that you will receive it, and it will be given to you. St. Paul says it with words that have no other interpretation. Faith is the certainty of things hoped for, the conviction of things seen. I have told you before that faith is the conviction of what is good. 
Now I will tell you that conviction comes from knowledge. Suppose you live in the province and you have never been to the capital. You want to go to the capital and you take the train, car or plane. You know where the capital is and how to get there. One day you head for the capital and you use whatever means of transport suits you best. But along the way, you're not afraid of detouring to the moon, are you? If you were a wild Indian, you would be trembling with fear because you are totally unaware of what is happening to you. But if you are a civilized person, you go calmly, knowing that at such and such an hour, you will arrive at the capital. Knowledge, ignorance of the principles of creation, is what makes the world fear evil, not knowing how to use faith, not even what it is. Faith is conviction, assurance, but these have to be based on knowledge of something. You know that the capital exists and that you are going towards it. That's why you know you won't end up on the moon. Now you know that when you desire something, if you fear not getting it, you will not get it. If you deny it before you receive it, as in the example already given of the prayer addressed to God by the generality of humans, my God grant me such a thing, although I know that you will not give it to me because you will think that it does not suit me. You will not obtain it because you have denied it beforehand. You have confessed that you do not expect it. Let me give you the metaphysical formula to get what one desires. It is a formula to be used for everything. Try it for yourself. Do not blindly believe me. I desire such a thing in harmony for the whole world and in accordance with the divine will. Under grace and in a perfect way, thank you, Father, that you have heard me. Now do not hesitate for a moment. You have used the magic formula. You have fulfilled the whole law and it will not be long before you will see your desire manifested be patient. The longer you wait, the sooner you will see the result. Impatience, tension and mental insistence destroy the treatment. The formula is what in metaphysics is called a treatment. So that you know what you have done by repeating the formula, I will explain the process in detail. By saying, in harmony for the whole world, you have eliminated all danger, that your convenience will harm others, just as it does not become possible for you to wish evil for another. By saying, in accordance with the divine will, if what you wish for is less than perfect for you, you will see that something much better happens than you expected. In this case it means that what you were wishing for was not going to be good enough, or was not going to be as good as you thought. God's will is perfect. When it says under grace and in a perfect way, it holds a wonderful secret, but let me give you an example of what happens when you don't know how to ask under grace and in a perfect way. A lady urgently needed a sum of money and she asked for it on the 15th of every month. She had absolute faith that she would receive it, but her selfishness and indifference did not inspire her to ask for it with any consideration for others. The next day an automobile caused damage to her daughter, and on the 15th of the month she received the exact amount she had asked for. The insurance company paid her for her daughter's accident. She asserted the law against herself. To ask under grace and in a perfect manner is to work with the spiritual law, the law of God, which always manifests itself on the spiritual plane. There, on the spiritual plane, everything is perfect, without hindrance, without obstacle, without hindrance, without hindrance, without stumbling or harm to anyone, without struggle or effort, smoothly, all with great love, and that is our truth. That is the truth which, when known, sets us free. Thank you, Father, for you have heard me. That is the highest expression of faith we can cherish. Jesus taught it and applied it to everything, from before breaking the bread, with which he fed five thousand, to telling how to turn the wine into his blood, giving thanks to the Father before seeing the manifestation. As you will see, everything Jesus taught was metaphysical. Whatever you desire, whatever you need, you can manifest it. The Father has already foreseen everything, he has already given everything, but you have to ask for it as you feel the need. You just have to remember, you cannot ask evil for another, because that is returned to you. And whatever you ask for yourself, you must also ask for all mankind, because we are all children of the same Father. For example, ask for great things. The Father is very rich, and he does not like stinginess. Don't say, Daddy God, give me a little house, I only ask for a little house even if it is small, when the reality is that you need a very big house because your family is large, you will only receive what you ask for. Ask, Father, give me and all mankind all the wonders of your kingdom. 
and now make your list. To strengthen your faith, make a list of the things you want or need. List the objects or things. Next to this list, make another list enumerating the things you want to disappear, either in yourself or externally. On the same paper, write the formula I have given you above. Now, read your paper every night and do not allow yourself to feel the slightest doubt. Give thanks again every time you think of what you have written. When you see that the things you have listed are fulfilled, cross them out. And at the end, when you see them all done, don't be so ungrateful as to think, maybe they were going to give them to me anyway. Because that's a lie. They were taken because you asked for them correctly, and the outside accommodated to let them pass you by. Since you are already very used to feeling fear, for various reasons. Every time you are attacked by a fear, repeat the following formula, which will erase the reflex you have engraved in your subconscious. I am not afraid. I do not want to be afraid. God is love, and in all creation, there is nothing to be afraid of. I have faith. I want to feel faith. A great master used to say, the only thing to be afraid of is fear. You must repeat the formula even when you tremble with terror. At that moment, all the more reason. Only the desire not to fear and the desire to have faith are enough to nullify all the effects of fear and place us at the positive pole of faith. I suppose you already know the psychological principle, which says that when a habit is erased, it must be replaced by another. Every time an idea crystallized in the subconscious is denied or rejected, it is erased a little. The little vacuum thus created must be immediately filled with an opposite idea. Otherwise, the vacuum will attract ideas of the same type and which are always suspended in the atmosphere, thought by others. Gradually, you will see that your fears will disappear if you have the will to be constant, repeating the formula in all circumstances that arise. Little by little, you will see that only the things you want to happen will happen to you. By their fruits, you shall know them, Jesus said. This great instrument, the power of decree is presented to us in that extraordinary account of creation found in the first two chapters of Genesis in the Bible. I suggest you take some time to read this wonderful account. As you read, you will realize that man, that is, you and I, was not created to be the set piece of circumstances, the victim of conditions, or a puppet moved by powers outside his domain. On the contrary, we find that man occupies the pinnacle of creation that far from being the most insignificant thing in the universe he is, by the very nature of the powers given him by his Creator, the supreme authority appointed by God, to rule the earth and all created things, man is endowed with the same powers of the Creator, because he is made in his image and likeness. Man is the instrument through which the wisdom, love, life and power of the Creator Spirit are expressed in fullness. God placed man in a receptive and obedient universe, including his body, his affairs, his environment, who has no alternative but to carry into effect the edicts or decrees guise of his supreme authority. The power to decree is absolute in man, the dominion God gave him is irrevocable. And although the basic nature of the universe is good in the Creator's evaluation, it can appear to man only as he decrees it to appear. We see that as long as man was obedient to his Creator, kept his power to think and make decrees, in tune with the spirit of good, which is the structure of creation, he lived in a universe of good, a garden of Eden. But when man fell by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and chose to base his thinking and the use of his powers on good and evil, what as a free agent he could do, he immediately found sweat and thistles mixed with his daily bread. Since the fall, man has been busy declaring his world good or evil, and his experiences have been in accordance with his decrees. This clearly shows how the universe responds and how complete and far-reaching are man's dominion and authority. Chapter 6. Love. There remains only this chapter to complete your knowledge of the first principle of creation, the principle of mentalism, whose motto is, All is mind. Jesus Christ said, You are gods. Gospel of John 10.34 Just as creation was all of it a manifested thought, so man, who is a god in potency, creates with thought everything he sees manifested in equality and likeness with his creator. This you have already learned. 
You have also learned the mechanics of this mental creation, the character, positive or negative of what you have created, the force, faith or fear, which determines the character, the way to change the outward aspect of what you have created, deny and affirm, the power of the word, which is spoken thought and therefore confirms the orders you have given with your thoughts, and finally, the infallible formula to create, manifest and obtain the best, the highest, the perfect. Know the truth. In abidance to the ordinance of Master Jesus, you know this truth is that we were created perfect, by a perfect creator, with the perfect essence of himself, with free will to create positively or negatively. Therefore evil is not a creation of God, it has no power in the face of truth. That disappears by replacing it, by the positive thought and word that Jesus said, do not resist evil, Matthew 5.39. That is to say, that we dominate evil with good. The only truth is the good. From now on, you will never again be able to blame anyone for what happens to you. You will have to look yourself in the face and ask yourself, how was my mental climate in this circumstance? Was it positive or negative? Did I feel faith or fear? What kind of decrees have I launched with my words? You will have to be honest and answer the truth. Are you happy with what you are seeing? Or do you dislike it, you will say? Now in Christian metaphysics, we say that God has seven aspects, love, truth, life, intelligence, soul, spirit, and principle. You see, all these aspects are invisible states. This means that everything is mental, so we cannot see or touch them. We feel and appreciate their effects. They exist, they act, they are real, they are things, and none of them can be denied. Love is called the character of God, the first aspect of God, the most potent of all forces, and the most sensitive. Few people know what love really is. Most believe that it is what is felt towards parents, children, spouses, lovers, etc. Affection, affection, attraction, antipathy, and hatred are different degrees of the same thing, feeling. Love is very complex and cannot be defined with a single word, but as on our planet, is meant by love, the feeling. And although this is nothing more than, so to speak, the outer edge of love, let us try to bring the feeling as close as possible to love, to begin to understand it. The central point on the scale, which goes from hatred to feeling, and which we call love, is tolerance and goodwill. It seems a contradiction, but when you love, too much or too much, tolerance and goodwill are missing. When one hates, tolerance and goodwill are lacking. In other words, both excessive love and excessive unlove are the negation of tolerance and goodwill. Jesus said, peace to men of goodwill, which implies that anything beyond that does not bring peace. Peace is in the center, the perfect balance, neither too much nor too little, and so in everything. All the excesses, even the excess of good, excess of money, excess of love, excess of charity, excess of prayer, excess of sacrifice, etc., unbalance the weight of the scale they lead more to one side and take away peace. When Genesis says, of all the fruits of paradise you may eat except of the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, it refers precisely to that. The trunk of the tree symbolizes the center, the balance. The branches start from that center, spread out to all sides and produce fruits. Some manifest themselves as good, others as evil. They symbolize the extremes. You will see then that the forbidden fruit which has caused so much tribulation in the world, is nothing else than the extremes, the excess in all aspects, since God, who created everything, declared good all his work, read it in Genesis, and only mentions the word evil regarding the excess. A parenthesis to recommend you to read and meditate on Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which begins, everything has its time, the Bible. Let us return to love, those mothers who say they love their children, who do not allow them to leave the nest or marry or act independently of them, when they are already men and women of age, do not love. They are selfish, and what they feel is a desire for possession. Those girlfriends and wives who suffer tortures of jealousy, the same. Those types of love are nothing more than excess of feeling. They exceed the measure and therefore go far beyond tolerance and goodwill. Excess of sentiment usually demonstrates 
that there is a failure in the development of intelligence. This, no doubt, will cause indignation in those people who fill their mouths calling themselves very sentimental. No one likes that another discovers his lack of intelligence, but it can show it. The excess of emotionality, like all excess, is bad. It is the proof that it lacks what counteracts it. Excess heat, for example, is balanced by an equal amount of cold to make it bearable or unpleasant. Intelligence is cold. Emotion is warm. A great emotional capacity is a superb and highly desirable quality, provided it is balanced with an equal intellectual capacity. This is what produces great artists. But the artist has his art in which to pour all his emotional strength. On the other hand, the exaggeratedly emotional person, with little intellectual development, pours all his passion into the human beings around him, tries to bind them and make them do his bidding. The remedy against excessive emotionality is to think and reflect a lot, especially meditate for a while and daily on intelligence. Beginning by asking yourself, what does intelligence mean? Continuing by thinking that everything contains intelligence in the universe, plants, animals, etc. And ending by affirming, I am intelligent with the intelligence of God himself, since I have been created from the very essence of the Creator. By intelligence, with intelligence and from the intelligence of God. Within a few days of repeating this treatment, you will already notice a change in elasticity as well as in mental penetration, and after only one week of exercise, one can appreciate the transformation in the way of loving others, a serenity and a peculiar generosity, which one would never have believed oneself capable of expressing. At the same time, one notices a total change in others, towards oneself. This is because we are individuals, or indivisible, and what affects one, affects all. The step that one climbs helps the whole race. We will now move on to deal with the number one enemy of all mankind, resentment and rancor, not to say hatred. There are hardly any human beings who are exempt from resentment without knowing that it embitters the whole life, influences badly all the manifestations, and is the cause of all the disappointments that we suffer. Even when we learn to deny and affirm, to know the truth, to watch and correct our thoughts and words, a single resentment, a grudge engraved, in the subconscious and in the soul acts, like a small fountain of gall which emanates its drop of bitterness, staining everything and contradicting, surprisingly, our greatest desires. Nothing, not even the most perfect manifestation can last, as long as there is that infectious focus spoiling our own being. The Bible, the churches and religions, get tired of advocating forgiveness and love towards our enemies, and it is all in vain as long as we are not taught the practical way to impose forgiveness towards those who hurt us. It is often said, I forgive, but I cannot forget. This is a lie. As long as one remembers an injury, one has not forgiven it. We are going to give the infallible formula with which to forgive and forget at the same time. For our own convenience, since this establishes us at the central point of balance, that of tolerance and goodwill, and this effort is love. St. John, the Apostle of Love, says, Love is the fulfillment of the law. To fulfill the law of love is to fulfill all the laws. It is to be with God, in God. It is to be happy, to feel satisfied and complete in all our manifestations. My teacher used to say, The man who loves well is the most powerful man in the world. And here is the recipe for loving well. Every time you feel something unpleasant towards another person, or you find yourself resenting something that has been done to you, that you recognize that you have an open resentment or desire for revenge, begin to deliberately remember. It's not about trying to forget what happened now. It's about remembering all the good things you know about that other person. Try to relive the pleasant moments you enjoyed in his company in times past, before the time he hurt you. Insist on remembering the good things, their good qualities, the way you thought of them. If you manage to laugh at a joke he had told you, or at something funny you enjoyed together, the miracle is done. If a single treatment is not enough, repeat it as many times as necessary to erase resentment or rancor. It is good that you do it up to 70 times. This is the fulfillment of the law given by Jesus. Resist not evil. 
This is turning the other cheek. It is loving our enemies, blessing those who curse us, doing good to those who hate us, and praying for those who insult and persecute us, all without exposing ourselves to being trampled upon. If you do it with sincerity, you will realize something very strange, and that is that, first, you will feel liberated, and then, that a mountain of small inconveniences that happen to you, and you did not know what to attribute, disappear as if by enchantment, and your life goes on rails. In addition, you will feel loved by everyone, even by those people who did not like you before. You will feel loved by everyone, even by those people who didn't like you before. What follows is that you learn to formulate your prayers, what in metaphysics we call treatments. As all day long we are thinking and decreeing, all day long we are praying, negatively or positively, and creating our own conditions, states, and events. The important thing is to remain in the state of mind that the prayer expresses. If after affirming, you allow yourself to return to the negative pole, you destroy the effect of the prayer. Watch your thoughts and watch your words. Do not let yourself be carried away by what others express. Remember that they ignore what you already know. Whatever you think and ask for yourself, think also for others. We are all one in spirit and that is the most effective way to give. Better than bread and arms, for bread and arms last but a few moments, while truth abides with the other forever. Sooner or later, your spiritual gift will enter your conscious mind and you will have done a saving work in a brother. The principle of rhythm, which is the law of the pendulum, the boomerang, returns to you the good you do, as well as the evil you do. It has been said that one with God is the majority, so that a single person who raises his consciousness to the spiritual plane and recognizes truth in the manner expressed above is able to save an organization from ruin, to save a community, a city or a nation from any crisis, for it acts on the spiritual plane, which is truth, and truth dominates all the lower planes. Know the truth, and it will set you free. In the face of sickness of self or others, I do not accept this appearance neither for myself nor for anyone else. I am life, in you, in me, in all the world. Thank you, Father, because you have listened to me. Repeat this affirmation every time that comes to your mind, that case that forced you to express it. In every case of fear, I do not accept fear. God is love. I am his child. I am love. I am made of love and by love. Thank you, Father, that you have heard me. In every case of sadness of self or others, I do not accept it. I am joy. I am bliss. Begin to list all the good things you have. Thank you, Father. For any manifestation of scarcity, I do not accept this appearance. My world contains all and I am the abundance of all. Thank you, Father, that today everything is covered in the face of all that is contrary to world or individual peace. I do not accept this appearance of conflict. I am peace, harmony and order. We are all one. Forgive them, Father, who know not what they do. I forgive all and I forgive myself. Thank you, Father, that you have heard me and always hear me. Metaphysics of the Ten Commandments we insert here only two, the fifth and the sixth. Among the laws called of God, which you will study when you feel like learning them, there is one called the law of correspondence. It has nothing to do with letters or mail. Correspondence means, in this case, that which corresponds to something else, i.e. equal to, as well as that which is equal to. Do I understand? This law mandates that the conditions of each plane or of each state of consciousness are to be found repeated on all planes everywhere. For example, we always want to know how are the characteristics of beyond, let's say. That beyond always refers to the plane above the earth or the plane below the earth. The motto of this law is, as above is above is below and as below is above. That is to say, just as on earth we have governments, schools, teachers, problems and the way to solve them. There are hands, feet, ears, eyes, there are sounds, time, space, there are flowers and fruits. In short, you know what is meant, in each plane. On every plane, there is what corresponds to all that, even if those other planes are invisible. To our earthly eyes, the only difference is that as you ascend in the planes, the same conditions become less dense, more spacious, say more pure, more beautiful, more interesting, but more complicated. Because in each higher plane, 
there is one dimension more than in the previous one. This does not mean that it is difficult for us to live in the new plane after leaving the old one. No, for the simple reason that it is not more difficult for a child to walk only after he has learned that nothing bad will happen to him when he lets go. Let us come to the point. The fifth commandment on earth says, Thou shalt not kill. This teaches us that we must not kill, you should not. But why is it wrong? No one really tells you. You simply must not kill. Let's go to the plain of the beyond. There the same law exists, only it says, Thou shalt not kill no matter how hard you try. Not only will you not succeed, but since the instrument finds nothing to kill, it goes back where it came from. You threw it. It hurts you, or hits you, that neither pleases you nor suits you, and you will not try again. You have already learned not to kill. Now for the moment, let us study the sixth commandment, Thou shalt not steal. It follows the same principle. On earth we are taught not to steal. It is wrong, it is not clear enough either. And on the plane of the beyond, the commandment says, Thou shalt not steal what does not belong to you. Don't even try, you can't. You can procure yourself an equal object, but never the same one. It will not stay with you and will return to its rightful owner. On earth these commandments seemed like prohibitions. On the next plane, they are revealed to you as conditions, laws and principles, which cannot be broken. No one can kill you or steal from you. You may not kill anything or anyone, you may not appropriate what belongs to others, nor may anyone appropriate what belongs to you. But that is not the only happiness. Take a good look. When already on earth you are incapable of killing or stealing, you are ready to learn the conditions of the other plane, which is called of consciousness. That is to say, when you learn the first lesson, you go on to learn the second, right? That's true, but the great happiness is that when you learn the second lesson, it is not necessary that you have died, nor that you are in the other plane beyond. No, you are alive and kicking here on earth. You apply the second lesson, and you are amazed to see that this law works the same for you here on earth as it does in heaven. That is, when you know that the truth is that no one can kill and no one can steal, then no one will kill you and no one can steal from you. No one can take your car from your door even if you leave the switch stuck. No one can rip your purse off your arm or break into your house at night or overcharge you. Nothing, nothing that is not honest can happen to you. What is yours is yours and no one else's. We will explain why this is so in the following paragraphs. Why can't you kill? Because life is just that, life. It is not death. Life cannot die, because that would be a contradiction in terms. Life is eternally life and can never be death. Then, you say, what happens to me? I never die because I am alive. Exactly. You are in eternity, and no one can take your life away from you. Your life is God. Who takes away God's life? That's why you cannot kill anyone, and he continues to live, more alive than ever on the other plane, just like you. But now you know that what you do on earth is also returned to you. Why? By the law of correspondence. Because everything on one plane has its correspondence in the others, in all the others. This law says, do not do to others what you do not want others to do to you. You know the reason. If you have not yet learned to obey this law, start observing how everything you do to others, in evil or in good, is returned to you. Now why can't you steal? What makes this law work? First you will know that you have reached a dead end if you have not yet resolved to accept the law of reincarnation. Ah, gee, you will say, what have we here? One of our metaphysical mottos is, what you cannot accept, let it go, but read on. If you don't like the idea, don't reincarnate, but you won't advance either. You will remain stagnant, for the same reason that whoever does not want to accept that the sun will rise tomorrow will have to get into a closet every morning and stay locked up there during all the hours of sunshine every day. The law of evolution is an eternal experimentation and overcoming, as we have already seen above, in the child who learns to walk and who does not have to be afraid, because he only learns to let himself go. You know that everything changes from one thing to another, like the child who becomes a child, like the child who becomes a little turkey, like the little turkey who becomes an adult, then an old man and then leaves the old shell here and goes to look for a new one in the hereafter. 
When a being dies, he finds himself in the midst of a new set of circumstances in the beyond. But he has not lost anything of value, such as hearing, sight, feeling, will, free will, the faculty to move, to communicate with others, his identity, his I. On the contrary, as there is one more dimension, you see more, you hear more, you feel more, you understand more, you understand more, you embrace more, etc. In other words, nothing of what has been acquired can be lost. It is only adapted to the new conditions of the plane. This means that on each plane you acquire new and greater skills and knowledge. In each incarnated life, one acquires new experiences and learns to use new objects and instruments, which, although material here on Earth, have their correspondence on the other invisible planes. For what kind of advantage would it be to become a finished musician in the world and not be able to externalize it on the next plane? And you have arrived at the great explanation. What you acquire, you know. The instruments you have had to employ, learn to use such as cutlery, a bed, a match, etc. On each plane have their correspondences, do not forget. And these, being already yours, by right of conscience, as we say in metaphysics, appear automatically in your life or lives one after another, because you cannot be born in a family which does not have the means to provide you what belongs to you by right of conscience. It often happens that a child comes into the world in a family lacking what belongs to him by right, and it turns out that soon the family acquires that, as if it were a great coincidence. That is why you cannot steal what is yours, nor can you take possession of what you have not earned or overcome in a previous life. That is why the great happiness is that knowing this law and these conditions, the law works on this earthly plane and on all planes. Therefore, you can be sure that no one can cause you loss or take anything from you, not even your husband or wife, as long as you have not done it to someone else. And then, why fear? And if you have already learned it in this life, it is that you have it by right of conscience. So the way to live happily is to learn the metaphysics of the Ten Commandments. With this small gift that we offer you, you will have put your foot on the first step of happiness. I will never tire of recommending that you constantly read this booklet. Do not throw it in the drawer and keep it in your pocket or in your wallet. Reread it, if you can, every day. Try to practice it, remember its instructions, and when you feel that the time has come to acquire more instruction, attend our lectures and get the following books. It will cost you nothing. You will only pay for the books you want to acquire, as they have to be sold in order to reproduce them. Receive all our love. May the light of your beloved presence of the I Am envelop you, fill you, enlighten you, guide you, and accompany you.